Stanford University. For today's class, we're going to be talking a lot about um, Mark's experiences, both in the public sector, private sector, kind of the mix between the two, and then also really focusing on your experience at RPE. Um, so, um, and then opening up to the class for questions, and feel free to interrupt any time with questions. Um, so, go ahead and get started um, in terms of um, just your early career and government work very early on. Um, you completed your bachelor's and master's in chemical engineering at MIT and then um, PhD in the same field at Berkeley. And then you returned to MIT's uh, Lincoln Lab, which is a uh, federally funded, I believe it's funded by the Department of Defense, um, kind of R&D center, um, chartered to apply advanced technology to problems of national security. and. Um, one of the main things that we've looked at in the class so far is just kind of the um, interaction between main research universities like Stanford, like MIT, with the U.S. government. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, kind of your work at Lincoln Lab and also um, kind of uh, aspects of the government academic partnership that existed there? Sure, happy to. So first, uh, welcome and uh, thanks for having me today. I'm happy to be here. Um, I, I will amend the bio slightly. I, I actually decided between Stanford and Berkeley for my PhD. I ended up, I ended up going to Berkeley. Bad uh, choice. In part because uh, I had kind of reached this point in my career whether I wanted to do really sort of fundamental science or more applied science. And I was going to work with Kurt Frank, who's still here at, at Stanford in chemical engineering, doing polymer physics or uh, semiconductor processing up at Berkeley. And I decided I was going to do semiconductor processing. But, I've actually been here at Stanford longer than I spent at Berkeley now, so <laughs> my loyalties in the big game are, are a long time. Uh, if I did it by time, if I did it by paycheck, it would have been about three months before I switched because graduate student stipends weren't that uh, uh, generous back in those days. But uh, anyways, um, yeah, so, so uh, Lincoln Lab. Um, so I had, uh, you know, had spent time in Boston, um, uh, really enjoyed the time at MIT. Um, when, uh, when I did my thesis, I did a lot of work in semiconductor processing. That was kind of what I had focused on. And at the time, Lincoln Lab had just started a new DARPA program to sort of push the forefront of lithography technology. And you know, I spent time actually at Bell Labs in between my master's and PhD program and got involved in lithography. And saw that as a really exciting field and here's a program that's really trying to push the state of the art. It was something sort of beyond what industry was going to develop on their own and work on. So um, back in, in those days, if you remember, none of you were around then, but if you remember, um, the lithography or the semiconductor industry was being challenged. Um, mm -hmm. Semitech had been formed as a way to try and revitalize the American semiconductor industry. Uh, there was a big national security component around that because of the high use of semiconductors and electronics and a lot of, a lot of military hardware. Um, so that was a big push of government investment into that space to try and keep the U.S. at a competitive position there. Um, DARPA is um, a place where I wound up later, but DARPA is a funding agency within the Department of Defense. Uh, they started um, in 1959 basically in response to Sputnik and, and the U.S. falling behind in the space race. I don't know if any of you know that kind of the history of DARPA, but that was the early days. And they've gone on to do a number of things. You know, they, they took credit for the internet and GPS and stealth technology. Um, there were stealth programs going on at the time when I was at DARPA there. But, you know, we were really looking at sort of fundamental technology and, and they divide themselves into sort of systems offices that would do things like try and build a stealth airplane uh, to component technologies that would do everything from, um, you know, high-speed integrated circuits, pushing mm -hmm. the state of the art, and things like that. So, so Lincoln Lab, um, it's, a, it's a Air Force-funded uh, uh, FFRDC. Um, MIT has a long history of radar uh, technology dating back to World War II. That was really where radar was really first conceived, commercialized, or, or brought to fruition for, for uh, applications at World War II. So that was kind of the genesis of Lincoln Lab at MIT. And, the group I worked in was doing these very fundamental technologies. We were, uh, we had a brand new state-of-the-art um, semiconductor fabrication facility. We were pushing sort of frontiers and materials and processing technology. And then there were other groups that would take advantage of the capabilities we created to build new radars, to build new uh, detector systems and things like that that were mm -hmm. important for, for, uh, for what uh, their mission needs were. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess uh, between MIT, Lincoln Lab, and also DARPA, you became a fellow at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Yeah. What exactly were you doing there? 
Well, uh, so the DARPA program manager that I had, um, and who's been a good friend ever since, is Arthi Prabhakar, who was most recently just the, uh, just the head of DARPA. But she was at that time a program manager, sort of a position I'd held later. Mm -hmm. And as I talked to her about an interest in sort of how Washington funding and policy and science worked, she said, if you're really interested in this, you should apply for a fellowship. And mm -hmm. there are a bunch of fellowship programs that bring people into DC every year. Uh, some spend time on the Hill, some spend time in, in federal agencies. DOE mm -hmm. has a number of those now. Um, and there was a Sloan Foundation fellowship that, that put people at the White House Science Office. Um, and so I applied for a couple of those and, mm -hmm. and uh, got, got offered a few and uh, wound up going to the White House Science Office. Mm -hmm. um, I went during, so February, I'm, I'm sorry, September 92 to September 93. So I was there for the, the first push to Bill Clinton transition mm -hmm. uh, working there. So it was kind of an interesting time. Um, when I, when I first got there, um, they had four different offices, and there was one that was sort of industrial technology, and that was kind of my bent, being a think, thinking about semiconductors, thinking about manufacturing. And OSTP is kind of an interesting place. They are in the middle of everything, but they are, you know, in retrospect, you're kind of a cheerleader there. You don't, you don't have a budget. <laughs> you, you, can, you can kind of like, you know, uh, try, and, try and influence, you can try and, and cajole people, you can, you can you know, wave the threat of having the White House behind you if you mm -hmm. wanted to try and get something done, but it's harder to implement things there, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and then being there through a transition uh, period was, was interesting, in fact, because the team that came in to run OSTP under Clinton were mm -hmm. the people who were, had all come from what used to be called the Office of Technology Assessment. And I had had a fellowship offer there and turned that one down to go to OSTP, and they came and said, oh, we got you anyway, right? But, uh, but, but I think they all, you know, there was, there was always, always, you know, there were people who were holdovers throughout there that were nonpartisan, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, it took a little while to kind of sort out and get engaged in things there. But, you know, I did a lot of work uh, because of the semiconductor experience. Uh, this was when they started putting the National Advisory Committee on Semiconductors together. Mm -hmm. They were looking at um, building the first SIA roadmaps on how do we, you know, invest efficiently through transitions of different wafer sizes and mm -hmm. different technology steps. Um, did a lot of work on, you know, congressional testimony. There was a lot of big push on manufacturing, which, you know, still remains a big challenge in the U.S. Mm -hmm. today. Um, and you know you got you get involved in a lot of a lot of things, but it's mm -hmm. it's sort of like a mile wide and an inch deep. You don't really get mm -hmm. to do deep dives in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So, as I finished that up, I was looking for something where I could kind of mm -hmm. go in and really you know drive hard on a, on a new technology. And mm -hmm. knowing people at DARPA, mm -hmm. um, having been involved, we we did kick off sort of the last six months I was there, and a, a sort of government wide initiative around flat panel displays, mm -hmm. recognizing that as an opportunity. And then DARPA was trying to put a program. Mm -hmm together and they said, how would you like to come over and, and take charge of that? Yeah, so I guess maybe just like diving right. into that specific yeah. um, project, yeah. um, just as an example, I think what's, um, we talked about a number of different technologies that DARPA um, has kind sure. of rolled out and um, how does it exactly go from kind of idea and concept into actually implementing the technology on the project at DARPA? Um, so it's, it's basically trying to persuade um, office directors and then mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, DARPA directors that here's a new area that's important to invest in right mm -hmm. and here's a here's an area that can make a difference and in the DARPA context it's all about you know making a difference for the warfighter right mm -hmm. and so um, there was in, at both OSTP and and in in the Defense Department at that time there was a big push for dual use technology how mm -hmm. can we take a lot of the things that are developed in a DOD context and apply them and so clearly display technology was something that people could see was going to be a clear dual use technology mm -hmm. but you know if you looked at the the variety of different needs that people in the military had for accessing display technology and and, mm -hmm. and you know what might work on a rifle site wasn't going to work in a command center on a on a on an aircraft carrier for mm -hmm. example there was just a range of technologies that mm -hmm. you know needed to be pursued developed and and kind of put forward and it was clear that even though this was you know, yet again, one of these technologies that had been first invented in the U.S., you know, all the production had moved offshore at that point. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of amazing to think back to the, that point, but Sharp had a 70% market share of all the, all the LCDs in the world at the, mm -hmm. at the time of 1993. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. I'll jump straight into, um, from DARPA, you moved into a number of private companies focused on imaging and displays, uh, DPIX, Silicon Image, Simplay, what was kind of the decision for you to transition out of government and um, what was that transition like? 
Um, so, so I was excited by the, the emergence of the technology and the opportunities that were coming mm -hmm. from that. So, um, and DARPA, much like RPE, mm -hmm. evolved to be, is a kind of place where um, people come and spend three, four years, maybe, maybe they'll stay an extra rotation period of a, of a couple years, but it's really designed to get people in who work really hard, really passionate and pushing ideas, and then you bring in somebody new to kind of you know, pitch another idea in another direction. And so there are, there are some things, and this is probably even particularly more so on the, on the technology side rather than the system mm -hmm. side. It's, it's hard to build the first prototype stealth plane in three years, but you, know, you can push a bunch of display technologies in three years and somebody else can come in and kind of take mm -hmm. it in a different direction. So you know, the model was, it was, it was a, a good opportune time and I'd seen, seen a lot of you know, really great opportunities at this early stage of the display industry. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I came out and I went to Xerox Park, um, mm -hmm. which was one of the companies that I'd worked with, and then we spun out a company called mm -hmm. Depix shortly mm -hmm. after that. Um, so we were doing some, you know, contract research work for the government, but mm -hmm. the part of the company I wound up really spending most of my time in was taking some of the same technology that was used to make amorphous silicon LCD uh, backplanes and making medical image sensors, essentially digital x-rays mm -hmm. to replace film. And so I spent a lot of time in medical imaging, and working with customers there around the world, um, mm -hmm. and then um, you know, kind of, kind of pursued those things. Um, Xerox is kind of notorious for uh, starting up companies and then not really knowing what to do with them. Right? Uh, they had a book that came out around then called "Fumbling the Future," which was was kind of there. So they they kept trying to reinvent new technologies, and so we were one of sort of ten incubated companies within mm -hmm. Xerox. Um, nine of those companies were four guys in a workstation. We were a company of 60 people. We had a, a fabrication facility that cost about $40 million a year to run. Mm -hmm. And they kind of looked at it and said, you know, one of these things isn't like the other and, and sold us off to a bunch of our customers. And so at mm -hmm. that point it was, you know, became a lot less interesting as a kind of a captive supply uh, chain mm -hmm. customer. Um, and there had been a, a number of people who had worked on display electronics who had gone off to start, start another company called Silicon Image. Mm -hmm. So I, I wound up going over there and spending probably seven years over there. Mm -hmm. um, semiconductor company made the things that drive monitors and uh, the electronics that kind of make LCDs work. So it was kind of a synthesis of, mm -hmm. of the semiconductor and the display work that I'd done. Um, Silicon Image is most famous for inventing the HDMI interface, mm -hmm. which is on all the consumer electronics products now. So um, it was a it was a, a small little company that was a startup, but we worked with you know, first the PC community and then the consumer electronics companies uh, mm -hmm. to kind of really drive and push the standards and uh, get that technology going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess after all these different private companies, after um, that period, you were CTO of FlexTech Alliance, which um, is industry alliance with um, both private and government partnerships mm -hmm. focused on R&D for flexible um, electronics um, and also has funding from, for example, the U.S. Army Research Lab. Um, so specifically, from my understanding, costs were shared between both um, public and private sources. Sure. How exactly did that work out or what, it, what exactly is that structure like? Sure. So, so actually, you know, there's a, there's a connection that goes back to my time at DARPA because mm -hmm. FlexTech um, originally started as the U.S. Display Consortium mm -hmm. and it was modeled very much after what Semitech had done in the semiconductor industry mm -hmm. before displays. As we were trying to get a display industry, you know, sort of started and going in the U.S., having a supply chain that could actually deliver and support that was important. Mm -hmm. And so at DARPA, I had started this consortium mm -hmm. and it was... Um, it was a way of trying to get coalesce some of the industry players who many were pursuing some of the different technologies, mm -hmm. different kinds of display technologies, to find the common elements in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, and the model was that you know we'd get their input on what they felt were the most important things, and we'd want some investment and buy-in from them. So much like Semitech, Semitech was always a 50-50 split between government funds and private funds going into that. The challenge here was we didn't have a display industry that was profitable that was throwing off you know money that they could reinvest the way the semiconductor industry did mm -hmm. so a lot of the work that they did actually ended up being cost shared by the suppliers who mm -hmm. were developing uh, some of those projects so at, at USDC um, as it morphed into FlexTech and um, part of the reason I went there is I was become that was the, sort of the point where I was starting to become interested in energy applications mm -hmm. uh, the display consortium had involved to looking at flexible displays and so they were working on, you know, plastic substrates or things like that. And there were a lot of energy applications that also took advantage of that. So um, 
things like uh, OLED lighting that could be done on plastic, things like thin film solar that could be done on, on sheets that could be rolled up or rolled out. Mm -hmm. um, so I, there was an op it was kind of a convergence of an opportunity to mm -hmm. uh, take them into a lot of energy applications that I was interested in. And, and you know, having known the model, known the people, known a lot of the, the, uh, the you know, sort of the roles, even the funding people back mm -hmm. at the Army at that point. Uh, who I had worked with when I had been at DARPA, mm -hmm. it was it was kind of a kind of a good opportunity to go in and try and help make that that mm -hmm. transition for them. So, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they've actually done very well in the in the year since I left, since I went back to RPE. They uh, last year got announced as one of the National Network of Manufacturing Initiatives doing something called uh, NextFlex, so the, the, a big broad program on supporting flexible uh, flexible electronics, mm -hmm. which is kind of what we were trying to do back then. It mm -hmm. just took about seven years to bring it to fruition, I guess. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to focus on a couple questions on RPE, because that's kind of the hot topic that sure. I think a lot of people in the class are interested in. So after spending over 10 years in the private sector, um, you came back into the public sector um, and became one of the founding program directors at RPE. Mm -hmm. have a lot of questions about that. Um, sure. So I guess, um, why did you decide to go back into government in the first place? Well, um, you know, so RPE had been talked about for mm -hmm. a while as a concept. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, the, the sort of genesis of it came from a National Academies report called Rising Above the Gathering Storm, recommendations mm -hmm. for sort of how, you know, mm -hmm. U.S. could stay competitive and at the forefront of some of the mm -hmm. transitions in technology that were happening. And energy was clearly an area where they were starting mm -hmm. to see that. And the model for RPE was DARPA, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was, um, I looked at that as a great opportunity for um, being sort of at the center of some of these these things, it was mm -hmm. a great experience. I was interested in energy. Mm -hmm. um, FlexTech was moving in that direction, but not moving fast, mm -hmm. and not with the same level of funding that RPE was was going to have once they once it became a reality. Mm -hmm. So, so I'd been interested in watching sort of what had happened uh, in the tail end of the the. Bush administration, second Bush administration, they had authorized this, but they hadn't funded it. They hadn't mm -hmm. put any money in to make it a reality. When Obama got there and at the beginning of the administration with the Recovery Act, money mm -hmm. was put into that, so it became a reality. Mm -hmm. You know, it was sort of like this empty shell that suddenly had a bank account and could mm -hmm. go to work. And uh, so, you know, I, I told people at the time, if this is anything like my experience at DARPA, it'll be one of the best jobs I ever had. Mm -hmm. And then when I left, I said it was 10 times better than my experience at DARPA. Mm -hmm. So. It was, uh, it was, the opportunity was just too good to pass up, mm -hmm. right? So I guess, um, how exactly are projects funded at RPE? So uh, very much the same same way. Um, I, I'd say, uh, we, you know, a couple things that, that we learned, and I tried to bring a lot of the DARPA uh, culture in there. So again, it's a funding agency. They don't do any mm -hmm. of their own research. They don't have their own labs. Mm -hmm. they, they really sort of say, here's a target we're aiming at, and mm -hmm. we're looking to get, you know, people who can come in with a way that will disrupt carbon capture technology mm -hmm. with an idea that could be half the cost that, mm -hmm. that the people are, than the ideas that people are pushing forward mm -hmm. uh, today. We also s recognize that, you know, we didn't always have just the best ideas. At the beginning of it, there were three of us who were running the agency and doing this. Um, and even before we'd started, you know, the first solicitation they did trying to get some of this Recovery Act money mm -hmm. out was basically, send us your best ideas in energy. You know, mm -hmm. show us where we can save energy, where we can invent new processes or products, and, and it was wide open. And so we got 4,000 proposals that came in from mm -hmm. all over the country. Um, but it was a great experience because it was kind of like we had to learn a little bit about everything and, and find out who the experts were and who we could connect with. So, so we, we had two models. One was sort of this open solicitation that they mm -hmm. do actually on about a three-year cycle now. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's focused solicitations where the program directors will say, here's a problem that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, here's, here's why I think it's important. Here's the community of people that might be able to respond to a solicitation. Mm -hmm. Here's some of the ideas that might be successful. But you never write it so that you constrain it to mm -hmm. get just those ideas. You say, here's the problem I'm trying to solve. Here's the goals I think I'm trying to mm -hmm. hit. And you know, let the good ideas come in and, and mm -hmm. then go from there. So I guess for the focus solicitation topics, how exactly are those selected by the program directors? It's uh, it's a process. So, so mm -hmm. you know, there's there's kind of a pitch that you have to make internally. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that'll take two or three goes before you can kind of persuade people uh, mm -hmm. to do that. And and that, that was a good, a very good, very healthy process. It's mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a place where one of the culture things that was unique about all those is people are willing to kind of 
you know, question or challenge and do that. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes you would expect that might kind of result in a, in a, you know, a very sort of backstabbing culture, but it wasn't mm -hmm. like that at all. Everybody recognized that, you know, by getting lots of input, you get mm -hmm. better ideas and, and so you're going to be more successful with your programs at the end. So you'll do that. Um, once you get kind of the green light internally to do that, typically you'll hold a workshop, mm -hmm. uh, a public workshop. Um, you know, maybe 50 to 100 people will come in and kind of frame some of the ideas and concepts and have some things come in that could be um, maybe a little bit out of left field <laughs> in terms of a new idea. Uh, but it's really just to kind of stimulate the thinking, to help people understand what it is you're really trying to accomplish and you know, get some validation of that idea as mm -hmm. well from an external audience and inform them sort of. So when the solicitation comes out, there's people that um, kind of have a, a, a great understanding of what you're really trying to accomplish because mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to convey that in, in, the, in the, the technical you know, solicitation that actually finally goes out to start mm -hmm. the process for, for selecting ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you give us an example of a project that you ended up funding through RPE? Uh, I could give you lots of examples. So one of the ones that's probably still near and dear to my heart was mm -hmm. the, the project which a little company called Makani up in Alameda, which is an mm -hmm. airborne wind company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in this first open solicitation that we had, there were probably 10 or 12 proposals mm -hmm. that got to the, the so we had 4,000 proposals. We told about 300. Uh, mm -hmm. in, and in the proposal process, people will write a five-page concept paper at the mm -hmm. beginning, so it's not a heavy lift. Uh, but then there's like a 30-page full proposal that's due, mm -hmm. and so we, we winnowed that 4,000 down to about 300 at that point. Mm -hmm. And we had probably 20 or 30 concept papers on airborne wind mm -hmm. um, and five or six full proposals. Many of them basically said wind power scales with the velocity of the wind cubed, mm -hmm. the wind's better, higher, uh, higher in the atmosphere. but. Mm -hmm. You know, many of them hadn't thought through many other things beyond that. Mm -hmm. Makani had been uh, funded by Google, actually, they had mm -hmm. some startup money from Google. They had tried a bunch of different things that were, you know, kites on tethers with, mm -hmm. uh, with electromagnetic generators on the ground, um, different kinds of approaches. They kind of settled on, you know, we think having a airborne wing that's a rigid wing mm -hmm. that flies and generates power there and sends it down the tether is the right mm -hmm. way to go. And they had thought through you know, 10 or 12 steps much further than anybody else had. So they were clearly mm -hmm. one of the ones that, you know, that stood out in terms mm -hmm. of the idea. Then the question was, the idea really valid or not? Mm -hmm. And is that kind of a risky thing? And it, it, um, it's something that actually, in the, when we made our first funding decisions, we didn't fund. Mm -hmm. um, and in part, it's because at the time we were, you know, you basically got a 20 or 30 page paper, mm -hmm. you could read that and then make your decision. Mm -hmm. And you could, didn't have the opportunity to go engage and talk to the contractor, mm -hmm. explore the ideas further, challenge some of the thinking in that. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, was, th there was, it was intriguing but had a lot of risk associated with it mm -hmm. that we didn't really understand yet. Mm -hmm. So when we didn't select them in the first round, we had the opportunity to have a, a set of conversations, understand the challenges, mm -hmm. uh, talk to people at the FAA, for example, mm -hmm. about what kind of things might be needed. Um, and then we're able to fund them with, with additional money that we had at the end of the year to, mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Um, they performed very well. We realized that, you know, hey, this is nice, but you can't have somebody sitting on the ground with a joystick flying these things and scale that to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to wind farms. So the challenge we put into their program was to show us you could do this entirely auto autonomously. Mm -hmm. And they were able to demonstrate that. Mm -hmm. um, they got, um, ultimately they got acquired by Google X. And so mm -hmm. that's who's, who's funding them now. So that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of one of the success stories. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think project. really attracts a private company? We'll take like Makani as an example to yeah. get funding from RPE versus um, more just like private capital available such as Google, especially since the process for getting funding is so different. Like when you're mm -hmm. talking to VCs or Google, you're taking in-person meetings, pitches. For mm -hmm. RPE, it's you're sending in these long, lengthy proposals. I yeah. guess what's kind of the big attraction factor? Um, you know, so it's interesting. In the, in the clean tech space, the, mm -hmm. the venture capital, particularly at early stage stuff, mm -hmm. has, has really 
started to, to dry up, right? Mm -hmm. So in a lot of cases, companies really want to see that you've been able to sort of get through the hurdle of RPE. I mean, we had people who mm -hmm. viewed us as the team doing diligence on some of the deals they would. Mm -hmm. And one of the metrics we did at RPE was how much follow-on funding did we get mm -hmm. once the projects got selected. Mm -hmm. Now, in, a, in a, a battery company or a solar mm -hmm. company or a, or a wind mm -hmm. turbine kind of company, that's easy. And carbon capture, mm -hmm. there is no market for that, right? So mm -hmm. you do, that's not a necessarily a good metric for, mm -hmm. for s all the technologies that we were doing. But it's a, um, y you know, it's, it's a different thing. I mean, um, it's non-dilutive funding. Mm -hmm. So when I was at DARPA looking at display technologies, I had a friend who was a venture capitalist, and mm -hmm. he'd call me up and he saw a display deal, and I'd tell him everything I knew about the company, and he'd say, How, why do you know so much about these guys? And I said, well, they always come to me first, because I don't <laughs> take any equity, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, uh, you know, you'll look for ways, particularly in an early stage of a startup mm -hmm. company, you'll look for ways to kind of keep more, more mm -hmm. of the control of the company yourself. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's us, it's SBIRs, mm -hmm. it's state grants and things mm -hmm. like that that people will look for. And many people are um, maybe, you know, want to want to validate their technology further, get a better valuation mm -hmm. before they go out to the the mm -hmm. private sector market. And so mm -hmm. I see that happen over and over again. Mm -hmm. And as the market for early stage investment, particularly in energy, has dried up, it's mm -hmm. it's become almost the only path in some cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Uh, yeah, so what sort of relationship does ARPA E have with private um, sector investors? And do you guys provide any resources to companies that are looking for additional funding or investment to get connected to people that are interested in investing? Sure, absolutely. So. Um, you know, we have every year we have this RPE summit or showcase that happens in February, end of February, beginning of March. Um, there are usually, I mean, we'll, we'll arrange um, meetings for companies in our portfolio and even companies that didn't get funded by us to interface with venture capitalists who will come there or regional development activities or things like that. We had a tech-to-market team that got built up. I mean, the first three of us were all kind of engineers and technologists, but we, we, we quickly recognized, you know, and I can talk more about some of the challenges in energy versus defense, but um, that a lot of the, you know, we, we funded, I'd say the majority of things were small businesses, universities, or, or um, you know, maybe early stage entrepreneurs, less so on uh, National Lab or large companies. We did fund some of those, but we had a lot of people that we recognized were maybe academics who hadn't gone out, didn't know anything about trying to raise funding. So we started this tech-to-market team and um, brought people in who were former venture capitalists who could teach people sort of, you know, what is it like to go get a term sheet and, you know, how might you navigate certain things and how do you know what the market would look like or what the economic requirements are and, you know, prove to us that your technology is actually viable. So. Um, uh, you know, we had a, a handful of people who've done that, and that's actually been, I'd say, as nowadays, you know, tor you know, towards the end of my tenure there, you would spend as much time on the sort of market and economic opportunities as you would on the technical opportunities. They were equally important in making decisions about what kind of things that you funded. Now, I'll contrast that with DARPA, because in DARPA, you know, you've got a, you've got a customer in DOD, right? When I was working on display technologies, I would go out and talk to you know, I, I spent two days riding around in a tank at Fort Hood. I, you know, went out to an aircraft carrier. Understand the customer, understand what they need, tell them about what you're doing, and they would, under, you know, you'd get that feedback and you'd be kind of that bridge between the customer and the, um, and the technology developer. And we also had a group of people who were sort of service technology scouts who would come and visit us and say, hey, I know a place that could use this. And so you could, you could generate customer pull internally within DOD where if you could solve a real problem for them, price wasn't really an object, right? Energy, you're competing in a commodity market for fuel or electricity or something. And so if you can't find a path that gets that technology to market with a competitive price and position, um, you know, you're, you're in trouble. And so we had to kind of put an extra extra set of screens around those kinds of things. Right. Right. What's the, uh, the timeline for the funding? Is it a three-year period in which they, they get all the money in? And what's uh, RPE's relationship once all the funding's been given? Do you stay in pretty close contact even once they're getting funding from outside sources? Um, so typical program is two to three years. Um, and if you look at RPE, not the nominal program is probably three to five million dollars over that period, right? Um, 
There are companies who have come in for second funding, sometimes to extend where it, what they were doing and take it a little further. Sometimes it's completely different ideas that they've got, particularly some of the bigger companies uh, that will do that. Um, do we stay in touch kind of peripherally, but not necessarily in driving the technology as much? It's at, at that point, it's often kind of handed off, but uh, you know, many of them will kind of keep you appraised of what's going on and, and, and what they're doing. But it, you know, it's not like you come in as a formal advisor or a board seat or anything like that in, in, in the aftermath. Yeah. Did you use SBIR at all as an intentional lead into ARPA-E funding, or were those separate commitments of funds? Did you see it as part of one larger project or independent? Um, independent, and it took a while. I mean, when we first started up ARPA-E, um, DOE runs almost all of their SBIRs through the Office of Science, which is a different part of the agency. And then they would ask people for, for topic ideas. In the first year or so that I was there, we didn't even do that. Um, they just kind of took the tax and did their own thing. Um, by the, the last year I was there, and nowadays, RPE will, will have specific things they put in as a way of exploring new technology areas or solving pieces of problems. At DARPA, we were very much engaged in that. And, and, and I contrast this, you know, one of the challenges at RPE when I got there was it was three guys, right? And DARPA was a well-oiled machine when, when I was there. It had been running for 20 years or so, right? So the infrastructure was there, the processes were there, and everything was there. RPE was a government startup, and so it was a very different kind of environment to, to get to the, you know, the, the trajectory and, the, and the, the infrastructure and the methods of doing things that, uh, that, that you know, we had to kind of all build from scratch. Another question. Yeah, there was, there was an article where they said that you know the government has well, almost like the, uh, ARPA E has kind of funded about almost one plus million billion dollars in projects, mm -hmm. and then those companies in turn say almost like one tenth. A very few companies have actually got funding, private funding, which is almost of a similar magnitude. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is a challenge over there? Is it just because there are lesser private equity, private sorry, private energy companies? Or is it just, as you mentioned before, that is it just the product market fit is not pretty good? What, what do you think is the situation and how can we improve that? Well, so actually, first off, I, I you know, recognizing that RPE, um, so we're not trying to be venture capitalists. We're trying to, you know, push technologies and explore new ideas and, you know, break learning curves, you know, find new ways to do things. And like DARPA, it's really designed to be a, a high risk high reward kind of agency, right? So um, it's, you don't find that. And so this is, this is why I thought it was really interesting at DOE is most of the things they do, at the Office of Science, it's very fundamental. They're not really looking for how do we apply this? It's can we get a Nobel Prize or can we get you know, uh, some award for the science we're doing and really pushing the frontiers of knowledge for knowledge sake it's in, and you know, the applications will come. Um, on the applied program side, and they've gotten better over the past years, but it was very working closely with industry and looking at more, I'd say, incremental kinds of technology improvements. So there was a gap there where if you had a crazy idea like an airborne wind turbine or trying to make CO2 into fuels using microbial you know, things or doubling the energy density of a battery, um, one of the things is that the people who worked at DOE didn't take those kinds of risks because having a project not work was considered a, a black mark on your career, right? At RPE or at DARPA, you, you were supposed to take those risks. And so it, was, it created an environment that allows you to do that. So in the carbon capture program, out of 13 projects that I had, I killed five of them before they even finished. And in every case, the, the company was happy to stop too, right? We had a thesis, we had an idea. We said, if we can get this to work, this will be really great. And after three months or, or nine months or a year and a half, we're like, you know, this isn't working. We've tried a couple of alternative paths. Let's just, you know, say we're done. And, and this, this idea didn't pan out, right? And so you need a place that can kind of do that. Venture capitalists don't probably won't do that, right? Um, yeah. You know, you need a little bit of diligence. You know, if you look if you look at Stanford now, there's a lot of seed grants that come from places like Precourt and Tomcat and GSEP that allow professors and students to kind of go explore some of these ideas, um, but they don't all work, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I mean, I think, and I, and I, I guess the other thing I'd say is. You know, the carbon capture is an area that I, I focused in. I was, I was the one chemical engineer there, right? So that was kind of uh, something we did. And carbon capture, 
um, there is no market for, right? When we started the program, Waxman Markey Bill had passed the House. Imagine that nowadays, that we actually passed a cap and trade bill through the House, right? But um, <laughs> didn't quite get through the Senate because they decided to focus on health care instead. Uh, but um, had that happened, that would have probably driven a lot different behavior and maybe created a market. There were people who were lining up trying to understand how that would work. But as soon as that bill didn't pass through the Senate, you know, as soon as that kind of, uh, and the next Congress came in that was Republican controlled, nobody wanted to talk about carbon capture anymore, right? Okay. However, you know, the government still works on this technology. There are, there are you know, academic research and things. So for me, the success wasn't getting venture funding to follow on on some of these topics, but there's another office at DOE called the Office of Fossil Energy that um, when I funded that program, I had two or three people from that, that office um, as part of the review committee. One of them said to me afterwards, you know, I'm glad you funded these. We would have never touched these things. They're just way too risky, right? Three years later, they picked four of them up and ran them through a pilot scale because, you know, we de-risked the technology to the point where they were willing to put a few million dollars more into it and say, let's build this and try it out at a power plant. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, it's not an economic success of raising private money, but it's a technology success of giving alternative ideas and keeping things in the, in the pipeline and testing them further and further before you, you, you know, before you start to invest the real money to scale them up. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Mr. you've obviously moved back and forth between private sector and government a number of times. Can you talk about, in broad terms, some of the impediments between the private sector and the government in terms of collaboration? Yeah, so I mean, part of my job at Slack now uh, is you know trying to work and build ties with industry, and um, so I've been there about five years. And uh, when I first got there, you know, it's it's funny you've got these these brilliant scientists who think that they're right across the street from the venture capitalists on mm -hmm. Sand Hill, and they can just walk over and tell them ideas and walk back with a check, right? And, and one of the challenges is at Slack, a lot of the work is very fundamental, right? You know, we're we were a high energy physics lab for many years. We've turned into a materials and chemistry um, analysis kind of lab or discovery lab by using this x-ray laser. It's a one of a kind technique, you know, tool in the world and it's really unique. But you know, somebody will say, hey, I did this really cool experiment and this is what I learned and a venture capitalist will say, uh, come back to me in five years when you've got a prototype of the process that I'm trying to work on, right? The, the gap was really just too wide. So. One of the things I've done in the last few years is actually start up a group that does work more in that applied space, looking at, at batteries, looking at solar. And so we're trying to find a better connection for that. So you know, technology maturity and expectations on both sides is one thing that's a challenge. Um, the process for how we work with industry at a lab can be you know, cumbersome sometimes, right? It's, uh, we, you know, we have to work with, um, through defined contracting mechanisms that may or may not have IP involved in them, depending on which one you do. Uh, but for example, in a normal partnership, you know, in, you may kind of work along this and, and, and have milestones that will get supported. You know, here we actually have to get our payment up front. So somebody describes it as if you were gonna build a house and you paid the architect all this money, and then he came back and said, well, here's what I built, right? So <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not necessarily um, commensurate with doing doing business the way industry likes to do it, both at the speed or, or at the kind of normal kind of commercial terms. Um, licensing technology, probably a better pathway, right? Um, doing, um, at Slack we do a lot of work with pharmaceutical companies who come in and use our x-ray synchrotron to understand drug structures and help them design next generation pharmaceuticals. So that's an area we've done. We've started to do a lot more of that in battery research over the last few years. Uh, being able to look at sort of how materials work as you cycle them, again, using some of the x-ray diagnostics that we have. So there are ways we can work with them on, you know, on a particular strength we have that they can't get anywhere else and they'll come in and work with us. Uh, we've, you know, we've had very, we, we, when I first got to Slack, uh, scientists would say, well, why wouldn't I patent some, why would I patent something? I want everybody to be able to use it without recognizing that nobody will invest their own money into it unless they had an exclusivity to it, right? So they, it's, it's just a very different set of, you know, kind of mindset between, between some of the really, you know, um, I'd say academic scientists that, that didn't do that. I brought in a guy from Stanford who had gotten an RPE project um, on a battery company and had him tell the story of how he spent a year and a half going around knocking on doors, pitching uh, his idea before he could raise his first million dollars. And, 
and how he you know, slept on the couch in his parents' basement and ate cereal every day. And they all kind of said, wow, I didn't know it was that hard. Right? You know, so you know, a little dose of reality is, is kind of important to be able to get the expectations a little, little more aligned there. But uh, it, it's a challenge that people are still and forever working on. Uh, yeah. okay, sir, can you build on that a little bit and say what sort of value was created by you bouncing back and forth between the public and private sector, both for yourself and for the organizations that you work for? Um, so I think being able to um, understand the perspective of either side is a really important thing. And, I, and so, you know, even, even when I worked in private sector, uh, you know, going out and meeting with customers and being a li good listener and understanding, you know, so the sales guy always wants to sell what he's got today. Um, I was usually kind of the engineering or product support behind that. And I'm listening for what's the next product we need to be working on to bring back and tell them. So, so having a good understanding of what the, what the customer is really looking for. And, and I would say, you know, that even goes to somebody who's trying to apply for federal funding. You know, understand what your program manager is really trying to do. You know, we have workshops, DARPA has workshops. What's, what's kind of, you know, what, what's their vision and what's their mission and are you connected to that or not, right? So understanding that a little bit um, and being able to kind of, you know, understand what they're trying to, to accomplish and achieve. Um, so for Slack, you know, rec it's a little bit of a culture change. It's a little bit of bringing in people that have the culture that we're trying to create uh, to do that that can be models for others. Part of the reason I went and started the group was uh, that, I, that I have, as I told the lab director, I said, look, I keep trying to get these people to go do this and they won't let me just go hire some more and, and show how it can be done and lead by example. And he's like, go for it. And, you know, so we've, we've been, been pretty good in the last year or two in getting some of these new things up and off, off the ground. So um, it's just, you know, a lot of people come in to, and national labs are kind of like this, a lot of people come into them they didn't want to go work in industry where they didn't have the freedom to work on what they wanted to do. They maybe didn't want to go to academia where they were, you know, um, writing grants all the time. Nowadays, actually, you still write grants all the time at a national lab. Uh, so that part has kind of changed. But they kind of viewed that as a sweet spot and then stayed there. And so they got used to just sort of doing what they've been doing for a while and don't really kind of, um, you know, aggressively go out and pursue new ideas and new directions the way people in, in industry would. So bringing some of that, that flavor to it as well, too, I guess. Yeah. You kind of hit on uh, my question there, having seen National Labs on the DARPA side. Yeah. Uh, how have you seen the balance over the years change? Are the National Labs losing the edge on the next great technology to what's going on in places like Silicon Valley? Um, and do you see in the future a change in that balance between kind of National Lab developed um, basic research and, and what the big Googles of the world do? Um, you know, so we, you know, we try and build those connections where we can, you know, be in the lab that's in the valley, right, you know, but, and, you know, we've got Google coming in working with us on data mining out of our, our new x-ray laser that's going to spit out data faster than anything else we could do. We're working with them on a bunch of grid projects uh, that have machine learning kind of things. Um, so what we're trying to do is find ways to connect to that, get involved with that, and so we can participate in that. And, one of the easier ways, rather than trying to you know contract with them, is we'll bring them in as on part as partners on projects that we go and propose and bid. And sometimes they're providing some cost share. Sometimes they're providing data. Sometimes they're getting funding. A lot of other labs don't send money out to industry. We're trying to do that here as a way of kind of fostering better engagement so that there's something in it for them. Um, you know, so I don't think the labs will ever kind of move at the pace of industry, but we can come closer than we have been in the past on that. There's a question in the back. Um, how do you decide when to discontinue a project at like ARPA E or DARPA? Do you like completely kill it or do you try to like pivot it or change it somehow? Uh, so we'll definitely try and pivot and see if there's another approach. Um, you know, I had one that was um, working on trying on this scrubber idea for capturing CO2 that you know, if you could make three simultaneous order of magnitude improvements and we had ideas that we could, uh, that, would, that would really be great. But after we tried to integrate it all together, it turned out if you ran the flow rate really high, your contact for your mass transport got really bad. And so, you know, we didn't find a way around that. We tried adding catalysts, we tried different designs for the contactor, but at the end we just sort of said, you know, we tried a few things and it's not gonna work, right? Um, some of the companies that we funded have, have pivoted. One of, the, one of the RPE success stories, I think, was a, a company called Foro that did laser drilling, or laser-assisted drilling. 
um, by taking fiber lasers and attaching them into a drill bit that would go down hole. And it was, you know, for doing <coughs> deep geothermal wells. And the company, you know, the, the technology worked fairly well. It, it was a real stretch to get down to, you know, 6,000, 8,000 feet. Uh, but they have a great business nowadays decommissioning old oil wells in Bakersfield where they just have to cut 20 feet underground and they're, they can do six of these a day where it took you two days to do one the old fashioned way. So, you know, they've they found other ways of taking their niche technology and taking it to market faster to try and find opportunities for revenue. So, um, so sometimes we'll pivot within the project, sometimes the companies will pivot with the technology that they've developed afterwards. Mm -hmm. Just as a quick follow-up to that question, I think especially after um, the funding of companies like Solyndra or A123, there was a lot of criticism that government and RPE shouldn't be, quote unquote, picking winners and losers. I guess, um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, so every time we make a funding decision, we pick a winner, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to, but so, so it's, what we go back to, is this a problem that's important mm -hmm. and why, you know, can we, you know, can we find a way to make carbon capture half the cost that it was projected mm -hmm. to be back then? Can we make a battery that will get a uh, 500 mile range in a mm -hmm. car someday, right? So is that a goal? Does that have a value in, <coughs> in sort of, you know, energy security, mm -hmm. energy efficiency, um, you know, changing the way we do decarbonizing electricity mm -hmm. um, or de decarbonizing the, the energy system? and. And we don't, and, you know, again, we, we don't write something to pick the technology we want. We throw the goals out there and let everybody kind of come at that. Mm -hmm. So that's a way of trying to, to mm -hmm. do that. Um, because we're taking high risk ideas, we need to stay pretty actively involved in understanding are they making progress or not? And mm -hmm. if they're not, hold them accountable for it, mm -hmm. right? So uh, because the first projects we funded were Recovery Act funded projects, mm -hmm. when we killed the projects, the money went back to the Treasury. Mm -hmm. right? We got a lot of goodwill for doing that. A lot of places would say, oh, you know, these guys will just let this run out because it's, you know, they at least get to keep spending the money. But no, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, we recognize it didn't work. We're standing up and saying we tried, it didn't work. And that gear gave us credibility that, you mm -hmm. know, helped us in future budget cycles going forward. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so the goals are the strategic interest that um, sort of circum circumscribe who you choose to fund. How are those developed? Do they come from another agency? Or are they sort of generated internally in terms of what what factor, what technology, what, uh, sorry, I'm like studying a lot right now. What technological advances you think will benefit uh, US security overall? So where, does, where do those come from? Is it strictly from you guys or is there a dialogue? Dialogue with lots of people. Yeah. So if you're like, let me pick the DARPA example again. If you go back and spend time with people who are the customers, right? You know, soldiers in the field uh, saying, you know, it'd be great if I had a, a display I could wrap around my, my sleeve that showed my situational awareness uh, or a head mounted display or something like that. And it's like, okay, here's, here's the need. What's the technology we need to get there? What's, what exists today? What doesn't exist today? Is it an integration or do we have a technology development thing for that? Translate that to energy, right? Um, you know, the average coal fired power plant is 33% efficient in terms of the heating value of the coal versus the power that comes out of it. You waste a lot of electricity in that. Carbon capture, you know, the way they were going to do that would have added 40%, it would have, would have taken 40% of the energy of the, car, of the power plant just to run the capture facility. So if you could, you could deploy the technology everywhere, it would cost a lot of money, but you'd also have to build 40% more power plants in order to be able to do that and, and run them all, right? So it wasn't really a good viable solution. So we looked for ways that, and, and, and a lot of the processes, both in the power generation and in the carbon capture, involves boiling a bunch of water and condensing a bunch of water. And it's just like this energy sink that goes into absolutely no value at all. So let's find a better way around that, right? Um, look at what's theoretically possible from a scientific point of view. How far away are we? How big an opportunity is there to go in and make a difference with a new technology? Or uh, desal, you know, runs at maybe 30% penalty <coughs> to theoretical efficiency. Well, that's not bad compared to 10 to 1 for carbon capture, right? So um, you pick your, you pick some of your projects based on is there, is there a clear gap and could you validate that? And uh, what's the business environment look like? Is it, is it acceptable to, or amenable to new technology insertions? Uh, but, you know, all of those things kind of factored into the, into the decisions on where you'd go. Thank you. 
Um, this might be a very specific question. Uh, the Pacific vortex that the garbage patch, it has, you know, just, if you've heard about the garbage patch, um, and, and this is really, you know, kind of bothering me. And I'm just wondering if you've ever had any kind of uh, projects or any, any company, you know, come to you to pitch, how can we make the garbage patch into, say, uh, some kind of an energy resource? Uh, I mean, any, anybody who's really come to you and what would be your take on it? Because I understand it's a, the garbage patch is not a responsibility of any specific country, and that's the reason why right now nobody's really looking at it. But then, has anybody ever come to you, and what do you think about it? Um, so, are you referring to in the middle of the ocean? All yeah, the, the all garbage stuff patch. That's yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a huge problem because yeah. it's like, a, and it's like a whole you know country by itself now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I haven't. I mean, the the, the thing that came. Closest to that is there are a bunch of people who have talked about um, uh, seeding algae blooms in the ocean as a way of consuming CO2 out of the atmosphere. And you know, so when people came in and started pitching that, I said, so what's the what's the legality of that, right? And and people, you know, one of the guys, uh, one of the guys I worked with, went off and did a bunch of work on sort of marine law and whether you could actually do anything like that. What the what the treaties and things were that would prohibit that, and and you can't really do that, right? But uh, um, this this is a different problem, right? The challenge is okay. You know, a lot of people take waste materials, plastics, burn them, collect energy from that. The, in the middle of the ocean, you've got a huge transportation cost, right? To try and be able to capture something, and do that. Not that it doesn't do that. Um, th not that that doesn't mean you shouldn't do something. It's just that it's. I wouldn't. I wouldn't pitch it as an energy production idea, uh, okay. because it wouldn't be very economic from that point of view. Because what I heard was that somebody, you know, there were some companies, specifically in the U.S. or at least yeah. some people, researchers who were thinking of converting the garbage patch and you know getting some kind of fuel out of it. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you know you've ever anybody's ever come to you. If you could do it at a small scale, where you, you know, it's a boat that skims it and produces it and does it right there, maybe yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know, uh, think of biofuels. The biggest problem in biofuels is is the transportation cost of collecting the feed, enough feedstock and getting it to a plant at the size that makes sense. Actually, is what what um, one of the biggest cost components of that. Right? Um, so I guess um, another question I have specifically um, with the energy sector. I think the mm -hmm. private sector has changed significantly in terms of funding available for energy, um, I guess pretty much since RPE started up until now. So um, around, I guess, especially in Silicon Valley, I think around probably um, 2006 or eight, there was kind of this boom in um, energy funding available from yeah. venture capitalists and then a bust. And then now there's kind of been more of this uh, focus on some energy investments, but more focused on green tech. But mm -hmm. overall, in terms of from like a very traditional kind of energy power, point, uh, yeah. power plant uh, standpoint, just yeah. a lack of funding. And kind of also, um, this has been referred to as the valley of death, and there's kind of this av availability of early stage, maybe um, angel investment funding available in energy, but then there's this valley of death, and then um, kind of uh, later stage capital available. Sure. Um, has that kind of changed in terms of um, just um, from your experiences with RPE, just how RPE has thought about funding private companies in energy, or? So I think the, um, I, I, I think there's a lot of challenges in that. I think I think mm -hmm. people have recognized so and so in the early or the mid 2000s, mm -hmm. um, you had a lot of people who were had made money in IT or in semiconductors who said mm -hmm. solar is another one of these things mm -hmm. that'll work. And um, what what happened is that pretty soon the scale of the industry got to the point where instead of raising 20 million dollars to build a small pilot line to show you were viable and then and then going out to raise more money, you you know you couldn't compete unless you could raise half a billion dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And so things like the loan guarantee program at mm -hmm. DOE would, would do that, and that's that's how we ended up with Solyndra, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I will say that I think that's been a much maligned episode. If you look at that portfolio, it's mm -hmm. better than any of the venture capital portfolios mm -hmm. ever. So it was a lot of political hay around that, but you know, another topic. Um, there are lots of challenges. I mean, the venture model itself doesn't necessarily fit with the life cycle of developing, validating, scaling, and inserting a new energy technology mm -hmm. in many cases. So there are people looking at alternative ways to do that. Um, family funds are often longer time horizon than that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you look at the breakthrough technology ventures, which is a lot of you know, high net wealth um, individuals who've said will contribute to that, 
one university endowment fund, UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. is contributing to that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've got a colleague from RPE who's at Berkeley who runs a program called Cyclotron Road, mm -hmm. trying to find a way to incubate innovation um, and let people develop their ideas further, working with DOE, working with lab resources, before they can get to a point where they can go out to the venture uh, community mm -hmm. or, or maybe directly go find strategics who will invest in that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, think, I think a lot of the challenges have been that, you know, everybody always looked at, particularly in the Valley, the venture model is the model, right? Mm -hmm. And so now I think people are taking a much broader look at are there other ways around that, particularly mm -hmm. for energy. Um, which is which is helping, and so RPE is part of that. Mm -hmm. You know, usually at the very early stage, that's a place to go with, you know, a really breakthrough idea that, you know, is kind of maybe what you mm -hmm. might pitch to an angel investor, or maybe a little bit beyond that, but mm -hmm. um, would have a hard time gaining traction with somebody mm -hmm. else until you had de-risked it and shown that it's, it actually was feasible. Mm -hmm. And so RPE can get people to that step. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, oh, sorry. Yep. I just wanted to ask uh, what you make of Elon Musk, Trump, Tesla, all of that. Um, it's I think, kind of strange to have a president who doesn't recognize climate change, who wants American jobs, an American entrepreneur who's creating American jobs but in clean energy, um, and who relies, or at least has relied, enormously on government subsidies and government support. Yeah. What do you make of that issue? I mean, I, that's deliberately vague, um, but I, I just, it's been, Something I've been thinking about, and I don't really know what to expect moving forward. Yeah, so um, I wouldn't dare to speculate on the new administration, <laughs> <laughs> particularly not on camera. <laughs> uh, but it's, I mean, it's, it, I, I don't think anybody really knows sort of what to expect there. Um, you know, look at, uh, uh, you know, the head of Uber resigning from this board because people assumed that that meant he was endorsing the policies and was supporting that. and. You know, a lot of people, at least half the country, aren't behind that. Um, you know, Musk is a credible entrepreneur, has certainly benefited from government support. Um, you know, Tesla helped get to, got, got a big help from the loan program to help get to scale. Um, you know, Solar City has gotten funding and has gotten a lot of support from the state of California in their solar programs. Um, you know, who knows what his motivations are, but he's, he's somebody who actually has a lot of experience and thought and credibility, and if he can inject some of that into the process, that's probably a good thing. I don't know that, I don't know that being on these things means that you're aligned necessarily with the policies and practices of, of the government or this administration, uh, per se, but, you know. I got another one for you. Sorry. Uh, New Scale applied for an NRC license to make a reactor, traveling yeah. waves, trying yeah. to, and I guess there's four or five actual fusion startups in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Based on what you see, do any of these things have a chance of competing with renewables in the future, or are those companies wasting their money? Uh, good question. I mean, you know, it's interesting if you look at um, DOE in the last years, you know, it's sort of knowing the end of the administration is coming, put out a bunch of materials on you know, how the price of solar has fallen, how the price of batteries has fallen, how the price of wind has fallen. It has been really significant, right? I mean, we've really kind of hit a point of no return, I think, in some respects there, where unsubsidized even, these are more cost effective than some of the other technologies that are out there. Now, that doesn't mean there's not intermittency or there's not other problems. Nuclear is a great base load power, and the problem is, you know, it can't compete with gas today the way it's done. And you know, somebody, you know, I think LCOE for a, for a nuclear plant is something like eight or nine cents, and most of that cost is the people who are there that run the plant, right? And, and the capital. And, and the capital expenditure up front. But you know, when you get to something where you're looking at extending the life of the plant, where you've probably you know, depreciated all the capital there, it becomes regulatory oversight, maintenance, compliance, kind of things like that. I, I like the small modular reactor idea as a concept of, can we get an economy of scale that allows us to get a learning curve and make these things cheaper? It's got a nice non-proliferation angle to it as well. The problem is getting it through all these licensing hurdles. So it'll be an interesting test to see, uh, something like that. Um, and you know, how, how low can we go? I, I was at a, a meeting, I don't know, a year ago. We had a bunch of European grid operators over here at Stanford, and one of the guys said, 
you know, in five years or 10 years, solar will be so cheap, we won't even bother charging people for it anymore, right? What does that mean in the world, right? So, um, not, maybe that's a little too forward thinking, but it's kind of like the old nuclear days of we won't have to meet our elect electricity anymore. Um, no, there is a cost, there is an infrastructure, there's a lot of things to be done. And, but, but these costs continue to come down and some of these renewables and gas prices are going to be probably low for a foreseeable future. So um, it's, it's got to got to find the right the right competitive niche now. But um, as somebody who cares about climate, that's, uh, that's got to be part of the solution, I think, and probably better than CCS with coal plants, as a personal opinion. Yeah. So you mentioned about the family offices or uh, university offices could become before and could be a better fit than any other. Um, the conventional investors, but you know, then what do you think uh, the current barriers to uh, those, what they call institutional investors, and what do you think that RPE is uh, differentiating? Uh, what is like a success uh, success factors for the RPE for you know positioning themselves in that area? So I, I guess I um, I don't necessarily equate the two of those together. I mean I'm, I I think there's a lot of things that are starting to be done to bring together family funds bring together this. I mean, there's, uh, you know, the Steyer Taylor Center at, at Stanford has done a lot of work in this with things like aligned intermediaries and, and stuff like that. I, I kind of think of RPE at the beginning of that pipeline, right, trying to seed and sprinkle the new ideas that can drive innovation. And, you know, we need a lot more of that kind of work going. And um, if you think about the challenges, if you think about what it takes to actually scale the company, It'd be great if RPE had a lot more funding to invest and could make a lot more bets because not all of them are going to work out. But then you also need to be able to scale these things and scale them to a point where they actually become impactful, right? Um, so how long has it taken, you know, solar panels to get to where they are and yet they're still only 2%, 3% of the generation capacity in the country? I mean, how many, how many light bulbs have been switched out for LEDs? We've done a lot, but there's a lot more still to go, right? And those are fairly mature technologies. Um, if we really feel that we've got to do a deep decarbonization of the energy system in the next 20, 25 years, we're going to have to accelerate a lot of this stuff, not only from the idea generation, but the deployment and scaling of all that. So I think of the investment as kind of, and some of those things as more on the, um, once it's, once it's been proven out, once it's kind of be, been made robust, and, and we're kind of at the early stage of that from RPE, you know, then there's maybe a venture piece or, a, or a, an, an early, earlier stage investment to scale to get it across that first commercialization validation point of view. But then, you know, you've got to have the financing muscle behind it to really, really make it scale. So, yeah, like part of, part of a continuum, right? So. Uh, Mark, so we're running out of time. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us today? Um, I hope you found that helpful. It's been a fun experience for me, uh, and I, I um, you know, I, 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 I've been passionate about this for a long time. As an engineer, I always look for technology solutions, recognizing that there's a lot more to to that. RPE and DARPA were, are places that are, you know, um, great experiences in trying to pursue new ideas, take take risks, accept those risks. Not everything works, but. Uh, it's been, it's been, you know, both of those have been really highlights of my career, and then trying to take the learnings from that into what else I've been doing. It's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So, very helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.